Praise the Lord. I think that we've been on vacation. Anybody been on vacation? Well, welcome back. Listen, I love vacation season. You can be seated if you'd like, but I want you to ponder on that one line or those three lines that said, I believe you're moving, I believe you're speaking, and I believe you're working all things for good. Because sometimes we can't see him working. Sometimes we can't see him moving. Sometimes we can't hear him speaking. But that's when our faith comes in and say, you know what? I may not feel it. I may not hear it. And just to be honest, God, I just don't even know. But I trust you. And I think that song, I love that little pause right there at the end. And then it says, come alive in the name of Jesus. That's sometimes we're dealing with some dead stuff in our lives that has held us bound and held us back. And this isn't my message, so y'all hang on. It holds us back and it keeps us in a dead place in our marriage and a dead place in our family and a dead place in our mind. But man, God wants to do so much more than that. This is a moment, I believe that in, in history, this is our moment, the church's moment to come to the top. It's time that we come to the top, not settle down to the bottom, not just take it, whatever it is. And if you're a first time guest, we thank you for being here. But listen, we believe that the voice of God should be heard no matter what, no matter when, no matter where, that we're not going to sit back idle. We're not going to worry about the political foolishness. We're not going to fall into the rhetoric. And so if I, if I get a little wound up about that this morning, you just bear with, bear with me because here's the thing. I came in, and the first thing I saw was the pulpit has been made into a barrel of monkeys. I'm still trying to rebound, if I'm honest. I said, dude, they have a barrel of monkeys, and someone said yes, in a very appropriate location. So I'm not sure how that looks to you guys. But, uh, but no, I'm excited about this uh, creative team. I'm excited about Vacation Bible School and uh, Pastor Tammy's already said it, but truly, if you're an if you're a arts and crafts person, a creative person, man, you can look. This wasn't done in five minutes, ten minutes. It really wasn't done probably in about 20 evenings. Uh, but God is so good to us and has blessed us. Would you take a moment and welcome our online family that they can hear you this morning? And we just, we just welcome you guys online today. What a great week that we've had. I pray you've had a great week. We've seen some rain <clears throat> and enjoyed some rain. I think that it's awesome when we can just stand there in the presence of God in that rain. Uh, maybe sometimes you're aggravated with it, didn't get the yard mode, didn't get to play ball, didn't get to go to the picnic, didn't get to have a whatever. But man, if you just ponder for a moment, step back for a moment, get on your porch for a moment, and just say, God, do the same to me. Rain down your presence in my life, God, that this worry has to flee, this anxiety has to go, the, the address that I've created called despair, that I'm getting ready to make a transition and make a move to freedom. And I believe that God's just going to speak to you in that rain. He speaks to me in the rain. And in my mind, you wouldn't want to be in here. You would be wore out if you were in there very long. And so if he can speak to me in my mind uh, during those times, I know for a fact that he can speak to you. So I just welcome you this morning. We're going to be talking about love today. Uh, the title of my message is, What's Love Got to Do With It? If you're my age or maybe even a little younger, you might remember a song in 1984, uh, Tina Turner, and this not a so you can go Google it and boogie. I'm just going to share a couple of things of it. Uh, but what a catchy title, right? What's love got to do with it? And, and Tina Turner, uh, you know, when she, uh, when she released that song, it just went crazy, man. She won award after award and award after award, song of the year, and all the things, album of the year. And that song put it over the top. And so I'm thinking, man, if that put it over the top, with Tina Turner put it over the top, doing her thing. Y'all know what her thing was, right? Yeah, some of y'all. Y'all, listen, I know I'm old, but come on, give me a little bit. Uh, and so, but in that song, I want to hit these couple things, these two things. In that song that made it so big, and in that song that had such a great impact to our society, believe it or not, uh, it seems that we can be impacted by a song to the point that we lose our mind or we find our mind. And so in that moment, she was declaring a couple of things in that song that uh, love is physical. It's physical, right? And we've all figured that out, right? We've all gone from being... 10 years old to 16 years old, and somewhere in that realm, you've realized our version of love is physical. And then it goes on to say that it's a secondhand emotion, right? But see, that's not what God intended. So I want to talk to you a little bit. I know it's not Valentine's Day. You usually don't talk about love till then, right? Uh, where we can hold hands and be all cozy and cuddle or whatever. Y'all go ahead and cuddle. I'm good with it. Just make sure it's your spouse 
and not someone else's. So while you're cuddling, yeah, we don't have a kiss cam, so we're not going to weird anybody out. Uh, and I think about that, and I thought, man, what an impact this song had telling people or declaring to people that love is merely or strictly emotional, declaring that it's a secondhand emotion, right? Uh, it's uh, physical, and that's all it is. And so I'm thankful for a God that declared different. I'm thankful for a God that loved us enough to make it physical. Do you, do you think? Absolutely. He hung his love at Calvary. He made it physical. And I'm not talking about a nasty, Americanized, or a socialized physical. I'm talking about a physical moment when Jesus hanged on the cross. He hanged as a bridge between heaven and earth. He hanged on a cross so that you and I could have, or have the opportunity at least, for eternal life. I don't believe, uh, if you'll bear with me, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I can't grab that. I just can't grab it. If you can grab that, then sometime uh, in, the, in the future, you can, you can show me scripture that lines that up. Uh, I can't find it that clears my mind anyway, that clears my conviction anyway. And, and so I want to talk to you about the love that hang at Calvary. I want to talk to you when people say, what's love got to do with it? It has everything to do with it. Matter of fact, that's all it was. That's all it was. It was his love for humanity that he turned to his son and said, would you? And he turned to his son and said, would you go? And his son in turn looked down even in 2023 and saw us in our mess and saw us in our lives and saw us in our failures and saw us in our stuff and said yes. And he, uh, and he descended from heaven and he came as, a, as a, a newborn baby, born of a virgin. And so if you want to see miracle after miracle after miracle and you want to see what love looks like, then we start in heaven and we start at Calvary or you start somewhere at the empty tomb and you say, now I understand what love is, because outside of that, you're not going to learn what love is on the school bus. You're not going to learn, your kids aren't going to learn what love is in school anymore. And so it becomes our responsibility to tell them that it's not all about the dirty physical. It's not all about the secondhand emotion, but true love comes from heaven and true love came at Calvary and true love came with the empty tomb and true love sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for me and you when no one else is thinking about you. When you feel like everyone else has forgotten you, Jesus is interceding for you and when nothing happens wrong when you have a day that went really well you can say you know what the reason I had a great day is because the love of God the love of Christ because while everything was against me this morning when I rolled out of bed I made it through the day I didn't survive it but I made it through the day because Christ was interceding for me the reason nothing happened to me tragic today was because of the grace of God and the mercy and his goodness and the love of Jesus Christ that now God has he has God's ear, and he's whispering to God and saying, God, protect him. Lord, send your angels. Dispatch the angels to protect them, defend them, be it, provide for them. And so when we see it, we have to see love all the way around. You see, I think it's more than physical, and just to be honest, I think it's spiritual. I think there's something about that because it's possible that it's nothing you can physically see. It's possible there's nothing that you can fathom. And so emotion has to slide sort of out of the way because, listen, if, if the love of God was based strictly on emotion, that won't be worth a lick because my emotions will change tomorrow. My thinking will change tomorrow. I'll be wounded tomorrow. Maybe I'm at the, at the top of my game today or at the top of my life today, and I'm saying, declaring the love of the Lord. But if all I have is an emotional attachment to it, then when all things go to pieces or all hell breaks loose, then I still don't have anything. But by faith, we grab that. And I love in, the, in Scripture that it's not just about me, though it's all about me. Right? It's not just about you, but it was all about you. That when Jesus died, when he stretched his arms between heaven and earth, it was, in fact, all about you. It was, in fact, like it or not, all about me. Pastor Tammy has a, has a I guess, a motto or a, I don't know what you call it, something bigger than that. And she says, I'm God's favorite. God reminds her of that. She reminds her of that. And every now and then, I'll remind her of it. And what we found is that when people hear that, they can take it one of two ways. Oh, who she thinks she is. Or they can say, me too. I'm God's favorite. I'm God's favorite because had it only been me, he would have sent his son for his favorite. Jesus would have died for his favorite. And so this morning, I'm just going to just challenge you with a statement. What's love got to do with it in your life? What does love look like in your life? 
is it unconditional love that we see on the cross because I truly believe that accepting God's love will transform us in such a way that we'll want to share it with others that they may be transformed. When you really get it, you can't give it enough. And when you're dabbling with it and it's just a, a secondhand emotion, when you're dabbling with it and it's only physical, God loved me enough, he healed my arm, he healed my whatever, he, so you've been operating. The next time you get sick, then it, what? The next time your emotions are raw, then what? But when it's based on faith, that you know what? is a God that I can't see, but I know. And when we're walking through hell and back and we're trying to decide and trying to figure, let's just not even do that. He says, lean not on our own understanding. You see, that's where I get in trouble. When I start leaning on my own understanding, but instead I say, I don't know when and I don't know how, but I know you will because you're faithful and you're a loving God. And so until we really know love, you can't really show love. Until we really understand the love of Christ and you really can't show the love of Christ, right? I think that we try to share the love of God with when we don't really understand it. When we're still operating in emotion, when we're still operating uh, in the physical, but when we really get it down deep in our knower, where we know it down deep in our knower, then everything begins to change because his love is unconditional, but ours, mm, not so much, not so much. One verse of scripture, and I'm going, to ch I'm going to believe that you're going to grab this, but I think sometimes we read or recite John 3, 16 almost just haphazardly. When Tim Tebow came out on the field for the first time, with John 3.16 on his cheeks. That day, during that football game, nine over nine million people Googled John 3.16. How awesome is that, right? But look at his platform. Okay, let's look at it. Nine, pe nine million people, okay, let's look at your platform. You go to work every day and do you show love? Do they see that John 3.16 kind of love? Have you shown them that John 3.16 kind of love? I'm not talking about one you write on your cheeks. I'm not talking about one you bandstand with or wear the T-shirt or get the bumper sticker. I'm talking about that kind of love. What does love have to do with it? If you ever expect to win your family, if you ever expect to win your coworkers, if you ever expect, it's going to be about love. We have pastors ask all the time, or we go and we, we are blessed. We are truly blessed to coach with great pastors uh, from around the world and and we have the opportunity to minister to pastors and pastors minister to us and so we're all getting fed at the same time but a big thing is how can we grow our church right how can we reach how can we and it's right here love when you begin to love people that seem unlovable you're gonna turn their heart when you begin to love people that no one else loves you're gonna turn their heart when you begin to love people let me grab this in John three sixteen. probably pretty easy for you right uh, I made up my mind however many years ago that this was personal for me. It's personal. I, I don't know about you, but he died for me. And so it's personal for me. And so when John 3.16 shows up, when we begin to read John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Can I stop right there? For God so loved who? The world. Right, the ones that we deem unlovable, the ones that we deem unreachable, the ones we deem hopeless. That for God so loved the world, whether you liked it or not. <clears throat> I found out a long time ago, it got a great revelation when I was questioning some things with God. You ever do that? Yeah. So I was asking him some questions, and he let me know that he didn't really ever one time ask my opinion on any of it. I don't know if that will let the air out of anybody else, but it settled me. I think it was when he was talking to Job, or Job was talking to him, and he said, Job, where were you? Right? Where were you? Hey, hey, Slick, hey, Slick, where were you when I was spewing the stars out of my mouth? Where, where were you when I was operating in all my glory and all my fullness and doing the thing that you're, you're experiencing? Where were, really? I think sometimes we get so proud of ourselves that we forget about everybody else. God keeps me humble, and he did again today. He put me right here with a barrel of monkeys. I think it's hilarious. Every time I look down... <clears throat> I started to change my message when I got here, but we won't. I'll let y'all read between the lines. And so when I look at this scripture, for God so loved the world, the world, who's that? That's you, that's me, that's, and here's, here's for us that uh, have already stereotyped everybody else. It's not only for you and it's not only for me, but it's for them. The them that maybe we've discredited, maybe them that we've pushed to the side, maybe them that we've skirted around, maybe them that we won't go down the same aisle at Walmart, maybe them that we try to avoid in a big crowd, maybe them, 
that we steer clear of at the, at the park or wherever we're at. And so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I think about that, that God would give us anything, really, right? We should never let this particular scripture, I don't think any, but we should never let this particular scripture lose its power, lose its authority, lose its place in our lives and in our foundation, because this is truly what it's all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, and let's stop right there. It's the whosoever's again. It's the world that he was talking about. He came for the world. He died for the world. And that the whosoever's, the you and the me's, because here's the thing. I was a whosoever. And truly, I am a whosoever. That I still have to call on him. I still have to depend on him. He still has to provide peace for me. He still has to provide a way for me. He still has to provide some things for me that I keep my mind right. Is that all okay? I think we operate by faith, but let's just be real. I need to see something. I, I, I need as a human to, to, know that, to know that I know. And so when I rolled in this morning, I got a barrel of monkeys. I got suckers on each side of me. I feel like I'm walking through the park. I'll leave that alone too. Y'all go ahead and do whatever you want to with that. Keep it clean. And so whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So it wasn't for naught. It wasn't for a show. It wasn't... Uh, for fanfare, but it was true love. So what's love got to do with it for the church? It has everything to do with it. For without it, we would have never seen the glory of God. For without it, we would have never seen Jesus on Calvary. For without it, we would not hear about or know about or, or get the testimony of empty tomb. Without it, we would not know and experience the moments that we heard and now we feel and now we know by faith that he sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us. Let's never forget this scripture. Let's not allow it to just become a banner in a big stadium, a big football stadium, in a soccer field. Don't just let it be a bumper sticker. Don't just let it be something that we throw out there kind of so everybody knows we're a Christian and everybody knows how spiritual we are, but instead it holds power, power in our mouth and power in our mind and power in our doing, power in our coming and going. And I believe that this scripture right here should kick the enemy's rear end completely out of our lives where we have any doubt about anybody because you don't get to choose their destiny. God chooses their destiny, but it's quite possible that he may use you to help them get there. And you won't help them get there if you don't understand the love of God, because if you don't understand the love of God, you won't extend the love of God. And if you've never understood the love of Jesus Christ, you'll never be able to share the love of Jesus Christ. So I'm wondering what kind of sacrifice John 3.16 brought. Because I truly believe that the corridors of heaven stood still in those moments. Do you believe that? I believe that the corridors of heaven, when Jesus was nailed to that cross, and if it wasn't enough that he was nailed to it, when they stood that cross in an upright position and dropped it down in that hole, I believe all of heaven stood at attention, and every angel stood ready, and every moment in heaven began to stop for that, for that existing moment that it just became quiet. And they're waiting now. They're waiting because Scripture says that he could have called a whole uh, league of angels, a whole thousands upon thousands of angels to come down and rescue him. And so now comes the wait. In that wait and in that moment in time, it was in that moment that we get to realize that, you know what? He could have called someone to rescue him. He didn't have to go through that. The whipping post didn't have to happen. He could have called them then, but instead, he went to that whipping post for our healing that we can declare healing in his wings and by his stripes we're healed. And so there's love at the whipping post we would have never understood if it wasn't real. And so now it's real and we're standing and waiting. And so if we were here today and we could look back and say, is he going to stay on the cross? You see, this scripture just leads me back to the cross because I believe that in our waiting, in our hardships, in our divorces, in our broken marriages, in our broken families, in all the hell that comes against us on a daily basis sometimes, that in that moment we would have, had we not had the scripture, we would have been looking at that and saying, is he going to stay? Because if he doesn't stay, I'm never going to make it. If he doesn't stay up there, I'm not going to survive this. If he doesn't make it, I'm going to be overtaken or overcome by everything that comes against me. When you understand the love that he had for you when he saw you, and as Scripture says that when we were at our worst, well, okay, it says that when, while we were yet sinners. And let me break that down. I'm talking the nasty of the nasty. He saw all of it. While we were at our nastiest, he still loved us. And so for me, it became personal because he who believes and she who believes and they who believe on him will not perish but have everlasting life. So for me, every day, I declare, you may think I'm a little weird, and that's okay. I love weird. I love weird. 
What's amazing is before I was saved, I was never called normal. Never. So now that I'm saved, I've never been called normal. I like it. And so it's personal for me. Every day it's personal. Tomorrow it'll be personal. This morning it was personal. Yesterday it was personal. I want to move to another scripture so I can wrap this up. I think sometimes, again, we miss the real of it all. Real, R-E-A-L. We miss the real of it all. Even when we read John 15 and 13. Greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life. Greater love. We could liken that possibly to anything else maybe. We could liken that to the military that we have lost and the reason we have a never forget garden out here. We could liken that to that for sure. But we could also liken it to the love of Jesus Christ. And what I love is when people call me friend. I have a problem. When we were running about 180 people, I knew everybody's name. I could remember their name. I could remember their kids' names. It was honestly, it was a miracle. It seemed like when we broke that 180, I found out where my limit was. And so at 450 and 500, I'm like, hey, friend. So if I call you friend, it's not that I forgot your name. But you never know. But if so, the person that I have forgot their name just thinks I call everybody that. Y'all good with that? And so when I think about that and when someone calls me friend, I'm honored to be a friend. I'm honored to be called friend. But when we find it in Scripture, greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. I think about that and the power of that. That he not only loved me, but he loved me and called me friend. I think we look at this and we miss the real because, again, it's just a scripture, right? It's just a scripture that we've become accustomed to in the house of God that we recite 316 and we move on about our business. No one stops to cry. No one stops to weep. No one stops to talk about it or explain it to anybody. But we want to read that scripture because that's the scripture that we know. And again, we find it in, in 15 and 13, and I believe we do the same thing. When that gives us great opportunity in that moment, do you have a minute? Do you have two? And hey, if you got a few minutes, then I want to tell you why I use John, why I know, and why I can tell you about John 3 16. People really don't want to hear scripture. They don't really want to know how much you know, right? They don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And so when you're sharing scripture, at least tag it with something. Right, at least tag it with a heartfelt testimony. Tag it with some experience in your life. Tag it with tears if you have to or if you need to. But never just throw a scripture at somebody as a tool to whip them about something or judge them about something or to bring them in line about something. I think we've missed a couple generations because of that foolishness, if I'm just quite honest with you. And so God has called us to be different. God has called us to a new place in history. We're dealing with a new thing in history. If you've missed it, then just track back about three or four years and you'll, you'll get freshened up again on it. We're fast-tracking the Word of God now. We have to fast-track the love of God. I want to read some scripture out of John 15, and we're going to start because I want to, for you to see this John 15, 13 a little bit different maybe than I've said it just in reading it by itself. So in verse number 9, it says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And for you and I to abide in Jesus or Christ's love, we have to have somewhat of an understanding of it. We have to realize that it was that love that hanged him at Cal, that love with the empty tomb. But that love that met me 20, 33 years ago at an altar at Austinville Pentecostal Holiness Church, it was that love that met you five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, last week at an altar or at a place of prayer in your car, at a place of prayer at your couch, at a place of prayer at the pew or in the chair in church. It was that love that met you there. And so if we ever forget that love, if we ever forget that love that met me there, and so as, as the Father loved me, Jesus said, <clears throat> I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Wow, isn't that something? I, I, would, I can't stay on that. Okay, I'll go just a little bit. If you, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. But why is that? How can we abide in his love if we, if we keep his commandments? Because we're not distracted 
by everything else, by, because we're not distracted by the sin that we have just allowed. Or not. We're not distracted by the things of the enemy. We're not distracted because now I'm walking in the fullness of God. I'm keeping his commandments. I'm not distracted by the things that I've dealt with or the temptation that drug me to the right or drug me to the left. And so it allows me, I hear people talking about righteousness. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure this society knows what that is. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about society, but they like to talk about it. They like to make sure that we know that they think that we're more, oh, you're more righteous than I am. And I want to say, uh, as a matter of fact, I am. Right? Y'all don't want to say that. Then y'all need to go with me and see the people I see because there is, there is no righteousness. So for them to deem me, question me, challenge me, that I think I'm more righteous than them, I'll never say it to them, by the way, that, and if anybody's listening. I am, in fact, in right relationship with Christ, and in turn, I am more righteous. Now, let's back up. I'm not self-righteous. I'm not, it's not because of me. It's because of, I accepted his love for me. I accepted the power of his love for me, and I can walk in such a way that don't make me perfect, but it allows me to be righteous and walk in his righteousness. You see, we play ourselves down so much because we don't want to offend anybody. We play ourselves and our walk with God down so much when he's called us to be warriors. I can't fight from this position. I can fight from this one. You see, my posture had to change when I became a child of God. My head was down and my shoulders were drooped and I had sin in my life and I had things that were, I was dealing with. Conviction was, was pulling me down and the enemy had a hold on me. Temptation was ruling my life and sin was ruling my life and I was in this posture. But there was something when I looked up to God, it changed everything about me. They sell these things that you can wear and I'm terrible. My posture is terrible if I'm around people shorter than me. Do y'all do that? It's like, hey. And so I, I told my bride, I said, hey, I saw on Amazon, I got those things. Make me look good. So I had it on the other day. I was working in the yard, and that's the place where you kind of, right, you're wore out. I come in, and she goes, what do you have on? I said, I don't even look like I'm tired, do I? I don't even look like I've been weed eating for three hours. God does the same thing. God, when you understand his love, when you grab his grace, when you understand the mercy that brought you this far, there's something about that. It changes our posture. There's some, I'm not being critical to anybody, and I'm not saying I'm more righteous than anybody. I'm trying to explain to you the opportunity we have to believe in ourselves because of the power of God, to believe in God because of the power of his love, to believe those things of God. And so if anybody misunderstood me, let's have a meeting this week and talk about it. I, I'm not all that righteous, but only by him. I, I don't want to explain that too much. The enemy will use it the rest of the week for you, so let's just leave it right there. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse number 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy, oh, hang on a minute, man. Now we're talking about love. We're talking about joy. We're talking about some confidence. And so let's look, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. How awesome is that? I think that sometimes when we walk out into public, I, even if you're carrying a load, can I just challenge you? Let's just walk out there by faith. Our shoulders back and our head up, a child of a king. I'm going to let people see the thing that God has done in my life. They may know what I went through. They may know that my brother passed away only two months ago, but I have my head up. I have my confidence in Jesus Christ that he's going to get me through every moment of mourning. He's going to get me through every moment of grief. He's going to get me through every moment of remembrance or reminiscing when I have a moment. But out here, guess what? I have the confidence of Jesus Christ. I have the confidence of the Lord. I have the boldness of God. I have the joy and the fullness thereof. And so when we grab his scripture and we're walking in his commandments and we're walking in his love and we understand the power of his love, then we get to walk that his joy remains in us and that our joy may be full. How is it by faith then that I would say I'm walking in my joy or in his? Well, if his joy remains in me, then my joy will be full. It's still all about him. It's still all about him. Verse number 13. Verse number 12. This is my commandment. 
that you love one another as I have loved you. It's tough. Don't get me wrong. At every challenge, at every mark, at every whatever. God's had to change me. Let me just be real with you for a minute. God's had to deal with me. Because if someone barked, my natural instinct is to bark louder. If someone, I'm, I need to rise higher. And that's our natural instinct. And so now we know that we're not going to operate in our natural instinct and glorify God. Mm -hmm. Y'all left part of that at the house, but here it is. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you. Wow. Just an honoring moment, right? He's not a dictator. He's not a, a, he's not a slave owner. But just out of honor and respect. God, because I honor you, I'm going to walk in the things of God. Because Jesus, because I respect you, I'm going to walk. Verse number 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have been ma made known to you. You did not choose me. Huh. And we say that every week, don't we? Will you choose, right? Will you choose? And I'll probably still say that every week. And probably at the end of this service. But he already chose us to give us an opportunity, right? That you and I have an opportunity, that we have a moment, that we the world, that we the whosoever's have a moment to come in right relationship with Jesus Christ. And it says, you have not chose me, but I have chose you. I choose you and appoint you that you should go and bear fruit. Uh-oh, shoulders back, head up. Love people that seem unlovable. Speak hope to people that seem hopeless. Give help to people that seem helpless. Reach people that seem unreachable. And even for some of us, teach people that seem unteachable. And so here we are. Guess what we're doing? We're producing fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you. And again, what's he say? That you love one another. How awesome is that? I may not even look like somebody you want to love, right? I'm sure I don't, but here's the thing. If you're going to heaven, you got to love me. That's, okay, I got better reasoning than that. Hopefully that you'll just find it in your heart to love me in spite of me as Christ loved me in spite of me. And so when he loves the whosoever's and allows the whosoever's, when he loves the Lord and allows the Lord, when we have an understanding of the love that he has for us, it will change our thinking. It just will. Of ourselves, absolutely. But of others, you better believe it. I believe that when we grab that, it will open doors of opportunity. And not just doors, but new doors of opportunity. Because I've already tried it that way, and I've tried it this way. And pastor, I'm getting discouraged. But guess what? Now we get a revelation of who he is and who we are in him. And guess what? We're no longer going to kick those old doors, hit those old doors. But we're going to expect God to open some new doors. Because now I have a different mindset. Now I have an understanding that it was all for me. Wait, it was all for you. Wait, it was all for them that Jesus went to Calvary. His love for them, his love for me, his love for you was so great. How can I not share it? I believe also that it will change our ministry. Our ministry is not Pastor Tammy and I's. Our ministry is exactly what I just said. This ministry is bigger than us, way bigger. We have 120-some people in our volunteer rotation. Does that tell you anything? It's not about us. We have 450, 500 folks come here on Sunday, 200 plus on Wednesday night. Can I tell you that it's not about us? But it's about you guys. It's about you ladies that answer the call of God in your heart, that answer the call of God in your mind. And then tomorrow, guess what? You go do what he's called you to do. You go bear fruit for the glory of God. Why? Because you understand the love that he has for you. A love that is unbreakable. A love that is unshakable. A love that is unconditional. Scripture says that nothing will separate us from the love of God. So think of the worst person you've ever heard of passing. The worst, the worst, the vilest, the meanest, the whatevers. Because we have that, right? We, we do that. That's the vilest person, man. That's the meanest guy. That's the whatever. And those are the ones we love, right? But let, just think, in their passing, in their passing, I want you to know something. The love of God was there. We may not grab it. See, we can't understand it. We can't fathom it. That the worst of the worst, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth, that nothing can separate us 
from the love of God. His love, whether we accept it or not, is up to us. But I have in my visual, or at least I feel like in my case, 33 years ago, his love was like this. I may have rejected him. I may have went down the wrong path. I went down the wrong road. I made choices that wasn't pretty. I made decisions that was downright ugly. I made decisions that affected me and affected other people that was ugly. But his love was ever present. And I can remember him loving on me in such a way that it changed my thinking. It's crazy that conviction will do that. And sometimes conviction will just make people mad and make people meaner, won't it? Oh, they're under conviction. You ever say that? Oh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. They're under conviction. That wasn't the way I was, by the way. When God began to love on me while I was at my worst, I was convicted. I knew what conviction was. People would get in my truck, and I, I had... Okay, this is a sign of confession. You're not supposed to steal. Let me just give you that real quick. That's against the rules. But when people get in my vehicle, knowing who I was and now knowing what in the world's going on, they would turn my radio on and I had stole some tapes. Yes, tapes. From my brother. Christian tapes. And they're like, what is wrong with you? What is this? And I would, in my mind, want to play it down. But the conviction of the Lord, man, I would just begin to cry. It was the craziest thing. I was a sinner. And I would just begin to cry and say, I can't help it. So I'm not talking about me bragging on me or telling you how bad I was back in the day. But I used to carry beverages in the back of my truck in a cooler. And after work, I partook of those beverages. They didn't have Coke Zero, so whatever. And in those beverages, friend, I stopped at his house. He flipped open my cooler, and there was a bunch of chocolate milk carton things in there. And he looks at me and he goes, what is, what is wrong with you? The tapes? Chocolate milk? I said, I can't help it. And I can remember in that moment in his driveway, I broke down completely. And I'm thinking, God, you've been loving on me. And I've been rejecting you and turning my back on you. And I know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. While you saw me at my worst, you're still willing to die for me. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I truly believe God is not going to let anybody exit and into eternity without having an opportunity to give their heart to the Lord. No one. He wouldn't have sent his son for 7,999,999,999 people and left one out. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. And so for God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you stand on your feet? This love is a love of great cost. But this love is free. And as you found out or as you heard, he chose you at Calvary. And if you're not saved this morning, that feeling you feel, don't get all toe up about it. I'm not saying I've done it right. I kept running, but man. Conviction just floored me. Not only did my friend see my tapes, see my milk cartons in my cooler, but then he saw me cry like a baby. I didn't deserve it. Never earned it. And had I kept resisting him, I would very likely, very likely, be in a devil's hell for eternity. So it's possible if you don't understand that kind of love, it's going to be hard for you to share that kind. (laughs) I needed him. But I refused him. Time and time and time again. When I went with my grandmother out of guilt to church, he'd love on me in that service, and I'd just turn away and leave. When I'd go for a baby dedication to honor some family, God would love me. I'd leave. So this morning, if that's you, man, you won't be near as tired when you quit running. You'll find peace, and your joy will be full. Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you. 
Lord, we're so thankful for your love for us. If we looked around the room and could see in the spirit today, God, those that, whew, if we could see their past, if we could see your love, the thing that you love through, the thing that you love bigger than, that got our attention. God, would you do it again this morning? For those that are watching online, for anybody in this building, would you love them above whatever they're dealing with? Would you love them above their hopelessness, their fear, their anxiety, their complacency? God, would you love them this morning? If you're here today with your heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe armed with the knowledge that he chose you, Calvary, <laughs> that on July the 16th in 2023, that it was going to come full circle, he chose you for this moment and this time, that maybe you'd be bold enough even, maybe convicted enough, loved enough this morning that you'd slip your hand up and say I'm thankful he chose me thank you and I choose him if you want to give your heart to the Lord today thank you thank you amen he loves you today everyone that raised their hand or maybe you did it and you're sort of second guessing saying I should have raised my hand and here's the thing it's not about me seeing your hand it's just an acknowledgement and God when you raise that you just open your heart to him and all of a sudden you have his ear and all of heaven stops and I believe in that moment when you whisper that prayer of, of repentance when your heart came open to heaven that it stopped in that moment, listening for that small voice that says, Father, thank you for loving me. And you pray something simple. If you'd like to repeat after me, I'll just tell you how I got saved. You say, Heavenly Father, forgive me. Thank you for loving me in spite of me. And God, we've been here before. I told you I'm telling you what I said. We've been here before. But God, I'm in it to win it this time. Forgive me. Make me new. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can everybody give God a hand clap of praise this morning? If you accepted him today, tell somebody. Find somebody with a lanyard. Make your way this way. We don't mind if we have time to grab you and talk with you a minute. But we'd love to put a Bible in your hand. We don't want, though we have one in here, there's something about that paper book. I don't know if y'all feel that way or not. There's something about writing it down. There's something about highlighting something that God spoke to you. So we'd love to put a Bible in your hand and send you out of here armed, right, with the sword. <laughs> because next week you're going to be right back in here growing and getting ready and being equipped to kick the devil's hind in day after day. Amen. We love you guys. I want to just uh, mention a couple things. Pray for Vacation Bible School this week. There will be kids here that may possibly never go to church or this is their opportunity to hear about Jesus. And as you can tell, it's going to be fun. The more I looked at this stage this morning, I'm like, dude, did you see? Wow, did you see? The piranha plant. Did you? You apparently don't have grandkids and kids that like Mario. But. It's going to be a fun time this week, and we're just praying a great presence of God this week. So pray for them. If you're a first-time guest, again, thank you. You could have gone anywhere, but thank you for being with us. We love you truly, and we just want you to know that God loves you. If you haven't felt the presence of the Lord, the love of God today, just open up. He's been here today. He's been here. If you're connected or if you haven't gotten connected, our creative click done all this, and you may say, man, I want to get connected to that then get connected to that. But they've knocked it out of the park this week, and I'm just so honored to, to people say, man, y'all done such a great job, and we know we're not in y'all. 
Pastor Tammy and I are not a part of the y'all that done such a great job. But we get to stand up here with a barrel of monkeys and act like we are. But if you'd like to be a part of ministry here, we'd love to get you connected with whatever that looks like. Uh, Miss Katie would love to talk to you over to my left and your right. I pray you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you. If not this week, of course, we'll see you on next Sunday morning. God bless you guys. Have a great week.